I'd like to return to an exchange you had with Senator Ayotte about the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, also known as the INF Treaty. Um, is Russia in violation of their obligations under the INF Treaty? We believe that a system that they have in development would violate the treaty. And, and you said just now in, in development, uh, I thought I heard you say with Senator Ayotte that it's not deployed uh, or it's not yet operationally capable. Is that correct? That's my understanding. I can have I can get back to you with a question for the record, but uh, it is in development, and we have indicated our concern with the Russians. If they did deploy it, we believe it would violate the INF. Thank you. Could could you please do that in writing, and if it's appropriate in a classified uh, writing, that's fine as well. Um, I'd now like to move to the Cyber Mission Force at the Air Force Association conference a couple weeks ago. Major General Ed Wilson, the commander of the 24th Air Force, stated that DOD's Cyber Mission Force was halfway through its buildup. How difficult is it to establish the needed infrastructure and manning across the services to create the capability that we need to defend and deter cyber threats? Well, I'd like to start, and then I'll turn it over to uh, Admiral Rogers. Uh, we're building to 133 total teams, 68 are cyber protection teams that are focused on our number one uh, mission, defense of our networks. We have 13 national mission, mission teams that we are building to help defend our nation's critical infrastructure. And we have 27 combat uh, mission teams that are aligned with the combatant commanders and assist them in their planning. To support those, we have 25 support teams which they can call upon for a total of 133. We're building to 6,200 military uh, personnel, contra uh, civilians, and some specialized contractors and another 2,000 in the reserves, so about 8,400. Uh, we expect to reach that in 2018, provided there is not another government shutdown. The last time we had a government shutdown and sequestration, it put us behind by six months in building this. Uh, so as of right now, we are, uh, I think we're on track. And I turn it over to Admiral Rogers to explain the, how well we're doing in attracting talent. And if I could first let me um, accent, if you will, on one particular portion of DepSecDef Works comments um, in terms of impact of a government shutdown or sequestration for us. Um, the last time we went through this and we shut it down, we assessed that we probably lost six months' worth of progress because we had to shut down the school system. We went to all stop in terms of generation of capability and the like a domino, the, the layover effect of all of that we think costs us about six months of time. If we go to a BCA or sequestration level, it puts us even further behind in an, in an environment in which we have all uniformly come to the conclusion we're not where we need to be and we've got to be more aggressive in getting there. And you can't do that if, when you're shutting down your efforts, when you're cutting money. To go specifically, Senator, to the question you asked, I would tell you the generation of the teams in terms of the manpower and their capability, boy, knock on wood, is exceeding my expectations. The bigger challenge to me has been less, not that it's not an insignificant challenge, but the bigger challenge has been less the teams and more some of the enabling capabilities that really power them. The tools, if you will, the platform that we operate from, the training environment that we take for granted in every other mission set. The idea that we would take a brigade combat team, but before it went to Iraq, before it went to Afghanistan, we put it out in the National Training Center and we put it through the spectrum of scenarios we think they're likely to encounter in their deployment. We don't have that capability right now in cyber. We have got to create that capability. It's those enablers to me and the intelligence piece, to let, just like any other mission set, everything we do is predicated on knowledge and insights. No different for the CENTCOM commander than it is for me. Um, those are the areas to me where the challenges are, are greater, if you will, than, than just the manpower. I'm not trying to minimize that. Yeah. And, and how, how important is it that we take advantage of the existing infrastructure and capabilities that we have as you're building out the entire mission force? I mean, that's what we're doing right now. But I will say one of our experiences, Cyber Command has now been in place for approximately five years. One of our insights that we've gained with practical experience and as we're looking at both defensive response as well as potential uh, offensive options, we need to create infrastructure that is slightly separate from the infrastructure we use at NSA. It's, so a unified platform you've heard us talk about, it's supported in the funding. That's an important part of this. Experience has taught us this in a way that five, six years ago we didn't fully understand. Well, 
Uh, I'd like my time is up for question, but I'd just like to bring to your attention that uh, Arkansas Adjutant General Mark Berry has requested a cyber protection team at Little Rock Air Force Base. There is an 11,000 square foot facility there. It has a skip of 8,500 square feet. It's already had $3.5 million invested in it. One of these facilities, I understand, would cost about $4 million. It's a request that I support. I think it's harness resources that we've already invested. And also, it's a capability they are ready to support, in addition to the Professional Educational Center that does a lot of the cyber training for the National Guard, which is less than 30 minutes away. Thank you.